In this video, we're going to talk about geospatial analytics in Snowflake. My name is Daria Vostovtseva, and I'm a principal sales engineer at Snowflake, supporting state and local government customers. Why should we care about geospatial data? Everything happens somewhere, and geospatial information is tied to specific locations, like a map with details. You're probably already familiar with vector geospatial data, such as points, lines, and polygons. You may have also heard of hierarchical H3 grid, as well as other data types and formats that geospatial data comes in, such as raster data, net CDF data type, and so on. There are many geospatial use cases. For example, you can use geospatial data to identify properties, transportation networks, and other critical infrastructure that may be impacted by events such as flooding or an electrical grid outage. You can use geospatial data to understand how accessible are the services to the populations that we serve, and where should we be building new schools, hospitals, or social services offices. There are many other use cases where Geospatial data is simply indispensable. Let's take a look at some of the native geospatial capabilities in Snowflake. Snowflake supports two native geospatial data types, the geography and geometry. The geography data type models Earth as a sphere or as an ellipsoid and supports the WGS84 spatial reference system or an unprojected reference system. The geometry data type models Earth as a Cartesian or two-dimensional plane, and it supports many spatial reference systems. It can sometimes be faster or even more accurate to use these specialized spatial reference systems. There are lots of benefits to storing geospatial data in the native Snowflake data types. First of all, it simplifies your code. It also opens up support for more dimension types, such as multipoints, line strings, polygons, collections. It helps improve performance, especially if you have to do geospatial joins. It enables you to validate geospatial objects. And last but not least, it allows you to turn on the search optimization feature, which can dramatically improve performance on certain queries. Snowflake supports a variety of geospatial functions for manipulating these two data types. For example, you can use geospatial functions to validate shapes, to measure distances and areas, to identify relationships and intersections, to transform and aggregate your geospatial data. In addition, you can use your own user-defined functions in languages such as Python and Java to extend the capabilities of the native SQL functions. And our partners make additional functions and toolkits available for further extending geospatial capabilities in Snowflake. To visualize geospatial data, you can use Streamlit and Python libraries such as Folium, Plotly, and PyDeck to visualize your vector and H3 data sets. On the Snowflake marketplace, you can find a rapidly growing list of data sets that contain spatial reference data, as well as additional functions, toolkits, and applications from data providers such as Carto, Mapbox, Precisely, and others. You can find demographic data, places of interest data, address data, and tools for anything from geocoding to further manipulating geospatial data. Some of the advanced features from our partners that you can Obtain on the Snowflake marketplace include geocoding and reverse geocoding, boundary data for boundaries of administrative areas such as counties, states, census blocks, 
and so on. Isochrones to find areas that can be reached within a certain time travel from a starting point, and lots of others. One example of a geospatial native application that you can leverage from the Snowflake Marketplace is Sedona Snow. It works natively with Snowflake and brings in an additional 130 geospatial functions that extend the capabilities of the native Snowflake offering. Snowflake integrates with ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Enterprise solutions from Esri to fit within your existing geospatial data architecture. With ArcGIS Pro, users can establish a database connection to Snowflake and create query layers to visualize, analyze, and explore the data directly without the need to copy it from Snowflake. With ArcGIS Enterprise, users can publish query layers to the enterprise as dynamic web layers with the option to reference data from Snowflake directly or copy it into the ArcGIS Enterprise layer to minimize latency. Next, let's take a look at the demo of some of the capabilities that we just discussed. In this demo, we're going to look at some of the basics of the geospatial capabilities in Snowflake. If you would like to follow along, you can set up your demo by first obtaining a data share from the Overture Maps uh, by Carto for the places listing. You can find it on the Snowflake Marketplace if you navigate to Data Products Marketplace and then look for Overture Maps. This is a data set that contains millions of point of interest data points representing facilities, services, businesses, and other amenities throughout the world. And then when you set up your notebook, don't forget to add PyDAC as one of your packages right here. All right. To first understand how the Snowflake geospatial formats work, let's take a look at some of the formats that Snowflake supports. There's three geospatial output and input formats that Snowflake supports, including GeoJSON, well-known text, and well-known binary formats. These are also the formats that you can set to display your data within your Snowflake session. Let's go ahead and set our session to use the GeoJSON format for our geography output format. This actually happens to be the default format as well. Now let's go ahead and first take a quick look at how many points of interest are in our Overture Maps Places dataset. There are over 53 million points of interest data points there. If we take a look at some of the examples of these data points, we can take a sample of 100 points where the category matches health and medical. Let's take a look at some of these data points. And as you can see, my location data is stored in the geometry column and the GeoJSON data type makes it look like this with the type of the value listed at the end of the string. If we go ahead and change our output format to well-known text, and rerun the query, you can see that now the data looks a little bit different with the identifier of the type of data point this is at the beginning of the string. This is arguably a little bit easier to look at and understand. In order to create a geospatial data element from an existing latitude and longitude, 
you can use a couple of different functions. For example, ST makePoint function can help create a geospatial data point or a geo point. All you need to do is you need to map the longitude and the latitude values to this function. Alternatively, you could also use the two geography function like this. Let's run this. And the result is going to be the same. The difference here is that two geography is a general purpose constructor function, whereas ST make point specifically makes point objects. To visualize geospatial data, you can use Streamlit. Here, I'm using a Python cell, and I'm using a, an ST map component of Streamlit, which allows me to quickly and easily create a map here without much setup. As you can see, I drew one point somewhere in the middle of Manhattan using Streamlit. And I did it by mapping the latitude and longitude values in the form of a data frame over to the ST map. Sometimes, rather than constructing geospatial data points, you actually need to extract the individual coordinates from an existing geospatial object. You can do that with the accessor functions STX and STY, like I am doing here. When I run this query, you can see that I'm able to extract the longitude and the latitude values. To determine relationships and distances between geospatial objects, there are many functions available. For example, you can use the STG within function to find health facilities and medical points of interest within a specified distance from a given point or points. And you can use the ST distance function to measure the distances. So if I run a query below, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for all the places of interest that are of the health and medical category and also are located within roughly one mile from the point that I am interested in. And then in the select statement, I can also calculate the distance between the point of interest in my overture map data set and my point that I am interested in. And as you can see, I'm able to identify, in this case, top 10 locations that are within mile or less of the point that I am interested in. Now, if I wanted to put this data on a map, I could again use Streamlit in combination with a, another Python library called PyDeck that enables me to create multi-layered visualization. So if I run this Python cell in my notebook, I can create a visualization that not only shows my original point, but also the 10 facilities that I have identified in my previous query. And that's it for the demo. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you would like to learn more, please consult the additional resources provided with this video and contact your account team. Thank you.